Hello, hello, good morning. Can you please take your seats? Right, thank you. Um, my name is James Hakim from the University of Zimbabwe. Um, I have um, an interest in non-communicable diseases, but um, coming from Zimbabwe where uh, HIV and other infectious diseases are, are extremely prevalent, that's also an area that I dabble in. Um, as you will appreciate, non-communicable diseases have become uh, really important, yet um, there has been insufficient emphasis and it's an area that is largely data-free in uh, uh, LMICs and especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, this session is for those who have an interest in curbing the emerging uh, NCD epidemic including injuries in LMICs, and especially in Africa. So we have uh, four eminent speakers. Uh, each one will speak for around 10 minutes, and we'll ask any targeted uh, specific questions, mainly for clarification, and hopefully at the end, we'll have sufficient time to have a broader uh, discussion. So the first speaker is Thomas Boyke. He's a senior fellow for Global Health, Economics, and Development Council on Foreign Relations and an adjunct professor of law at Georgetown University uh, in the States. Thomas. slides to uh, be put up, if they could be. Oh, great, here they are. Uh, so my name is Tom Boyke. I'm a senior fellow uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, the Council on Foreign Relations is a think tank uh, based here in DC, as traditionally focused on 
national security issues. I'm going to walk through a little today, uh, setting a broad foundation for the uh, esteemed colleagues that will follow me uh, for what non-communicable diseases look like in low and middle income countries and why an institution like the Council on Foreign Relations might be interested in a, in a topic like this. So non-communicable diseases are diseases that may not be, or diseases and conditions that may not be spread uh, person to person uh, themselves, but may be caused by an infectious agent that can. Uh, in low middle income countries, uh, almost half of the burden is cardiovascular diseases. Uh, the uh, largest remaining share is our, our cancers, uh, chronic respiratory illnesses. Diabetes is actually a relatively small share, but it is growing uh, the fastest. So non-communicable diseases now represent the majority of death and disability in low and middle income countries, 54% in 2015, according to the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. And this, this gives you a sense of the regional distribution. So for every region of the world other than Sub-Saharan Africa, non-communicable diseases represent the majority. But if you look at parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly uh, or, uh, South Africa, Madagascar, countries like that, it represents in the mid to high 40 ranges now, and we expect non-communicable diseases to represent the, uh, the bulk of the burden, health burden in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa by 2030, if not earlier. But despite representing the, the bulk of the health burden in the countries that we care about, uh, non-communicable diseases represent a vanishingly small uh, share of uh, development assistance. How small? Well, you'd be forgiven for not seeing it, but that tiny little orange band uh, on, the, on the top or in the, uh, uh, between the purple and yellow bars, that's non-communicable diseases. Uh, so it represents 1.4% of uh, aid per uh, glo global health. Uh, currently, that share has actually declined since the 2011 UN high-level meetings on non-communicable diseases. Uh, if you look at individual donors like the United States, non-communicable diseases represents one-tenth of one percent of where we uh, spend our global health aid. Another way of looking at this is how much aid do we spend uh, per disability adjusted life year loss to a disease, and these are international figures. And what you can see for HIV is we spend nearly $70, for malaria a little over $16, for tuberculosis, uh, close to 11, uh, for maternal, newborn, and child health, $5, and for non-communicable diseases, uh, 9 cents in uh, low and middle income countries. And you, it's, uh, even in terms of the, the aid that we spend, it looks, it's distributed differently than it is for uh, other forms of global health aid, which tend to prioritize low income countries or lower middle income countries. And for non-communicable diseases, it's tended to focus on upper middle income countries and to some extent, lower, lower middle income countries. So low income countries receiving a, a very small share of that. So at the council, we, we convened a task force to look at this. Task forces at the council are a big deal. Uh, the institution is 100 years old, and we've only had, at the time of this report, 73 of them. They're typically led by president, former presidents or former secretaries of state. Uh, and they look at emerging problems. The one we just did was looking at the issue of nu nuclear proliferation in, in uh, North Korea, and that gives you a sense of the seriousness with which we, we take uh, this issue. It was actually our first devoted to global health, and um, it was led by, or chaired by, um, Tom Donilon, who's the National Security Advisor for uh, President Obama, and Mitch Daniels, who's the former head of the Office of Management and Budget during the launch of the PEPFAR program. Uh, during George W. Bush's administration. And we asked these folks who had by and large not spoken out on NCDs uh, three questions. And the first was, is this a crisis in low, low and middle income countries? Should we care about these diseases? Uh, do the United States and other bilateral donors have an interest in addressing these diseases? And why should we do this now? Why shouldn't we wait to finish up progress on malaria, maternal, maternal newborn and child health? Why should we start engaging on NCDs now. And in terms of the first question, we really dug into the, the data. We were fortunate to have uh, Chris Murray on our, uh, on our task force, so we had access to a lot of the global burden of disease data pre-publication 
um, which was very generous of uh, Richard Horton as well to allow us to do that. Uh, and what you see is that the burden from non-communicable diseases is increasing faster, younger, and worse than we've ever seen in high-income countries. How fast? Uh, the increase of non-communicable diseases in low- and middle-income countries was uh, of deaths between 1990 and 2013 increased 53 percent. That's almost twice the rate of population growth. We took a stricter standard of prematurity than the World Health Organization does, which typically looks at 70 and younger. We actually look at 59 and younger, because that's lower than the average uh, age of, or average life expectancy of any region of the world. And what you see is that 80 to 80 plus percent of the burden in Sub-Saharan Africa and parts of South Asia arise in populations that are that young, 59 and younger. It's also having significantly worse outcomes. Uh, your chance of surviving uh, cardiovascular disease or leukemia or cervical cancer is largely dependent on the country in which you live. Uh, you see the premature burden of diseases and causes like this heading in opposite uh, directions. Uh, the tie between non-communicable diseases, this is from a health affairs uh, paper uh, I and others did, and the tie between non-communicable diseases and the poverty of a country uh, is stronger than it is for HIV, than it is for dengue, than it is for a number of other of the conditions that we prioritize uh, in, in global health. And this is counterintuitive to many people to think that you're actually, your chance of premature mortality from a non-communicable diseases, most non-communicable diseases, goes down with development, not up. Uh, it's also, as I mentioned, a rising working age populations. Here you see from the forthcoming paper where the, uh, we divided it into uh, age buckets and you can see the death and disability from non-communicable diseases currently in low, uh, low, uh, lower middle income countries arising in people 35 and older, so working age people, people with families, people who are participants uh, in the economy. Uh, you can see the shift upward for low income countries, but really what should cause us to worry is the, what we project to happen. Uh, so taking basic demographic assumptions by population growth and change in age structure, you can see a dramatic increase in the working age population burden in low income countries. This is a problem, of course, because these countries are still largely structured around acute care. And if you look at healthcare spending per capita, currently in a low income country, the average is $23 per person. In a lower middle income country, it's $133 per person. In a high income country, it's $2,200 per person. Uh, here in the United States, it's $3,800 per person. So if you're looking at a disease burden requiring preventative and chronic care, that starts to approach where the U.S. was just 10, 15 years ago in some of these countries. It's, it's a really, it's a grave concern. Uh, so for a committee, we thought this, this was fair to say that this was a crisis. Uh, the question is, why should the U.S. care? And as I mentioned, currently we don't. Uh, less than 10 percent, or less of a tenth of a percent of U.S. aid is on non-communicable diseases, and you might think, well, that's in, that's understandable because what we're really investing in are direct health threats, protecting uh, the homeland from uh, pandemic disease, uh, protecting uh, people from Ebola, and what probably most people in this room know is actually very little of the U.S. global health budget uh, addresses pandemic preparedness, which is a different but also very important problem. Uh, by and large, what we spend on are diseases like, of course, HIV, malaria, poor maternal and child health. Uh, we used to spend on family planning and reproductive health. Uh, issues that the burden of these problems in uh, lower income countries really has absolutely nothing to do with the burden of these problems in Indiana or in Washington. We spend on them because we care about the populations affected and the well-being of of the people who live there, of, of their people who live there and their governments. So we looked. We looked at the 49 countries where the U.S. spends five million dollars or more, and what is causing the bulk of the premature death and disability in those countries. And what you see is it's actually NCDs. Uh, so the burden, premature burden, again, 59 and younger from NCDs in the same 49 countries where the U.S. spends five million dollars or more is six times greater than it is for HIV. 
is almost twice as great as it is for HIV, malaria, and TB combined. Same country. So if we care about these countries, we care about their governments and the fortunes of those economies and their, and their people, we should care about NCDs. There's another way of looking at that same data, and what you can see is the, uh, the y-axis is the increase percentage-wise in uh, premature uh, mortality from cardiovascular disease between 1990 and 2013. The x-axis is the share of the NCD burden, particularly on cardiovascular disease. You see an enormous increase uh, in uh, the burden from these diseases, and it represents the bulk of what you see in these 49 countries. Countries like Bangladesh, which are low-income countries and having an enormous uh, increase in, in this burden. One of our members of our task force was Eric Goosby, the uh, former head of the Office of Global AIDS Coordinator, and he described very powerfully seeing in PEPFAR clinics people showing up who are obviously hyper, hypertensive. Uh, and there's nothing that can be done or nothing that would be done uh, for those people in those clinics. And there's uh, a de definition of insanity to spend billions of dollars to address one set of preventable, treatable conditions while watching people succumb in front of you to another set. Uh, in terms, we have, a, we have a fancy online interactive, which I would direct you all towards, uh, from this uh, task force that looked at each of these 49 countries individually. Some of the information you have in there is the aid spent for Bangladesh, uh, for instance, the U.S. spent between just in 2013, 75 million dollars. We looked at what the United States spent on non-communicable disease in terms of assistance, and so as to not cherry pick, we actually looked at a 11 year range between 2000 and 2011, and we had spent $10,000 on non-communicable diseases. Non-communicable diseases, as you can see from the pie chart, actually represent half of the premature burden in Bangladesh. So why should, we, why should we do something about this now? Well, the first reason we should do something about this now is there's potential for change. Uh, so we did two projections. We did a projection of what we expect the premature deaths from non-communicable diseases in these, just these 49 countries to be based on basic population assumptions about, again, changing age structure, population growth in these countries, and uh, you know, the current rate. And what uh, you see there is that's the, that's the top line. And then we did an assessment of what you might see if low and middle income countries, lower income countries, had the average rate of a high income country today, not even what it will be in 2030 for premature mortality. And you see a difference of 12 million deaths. And that's the potential. Not saying it's all achievable in the task force, we have particular recommendations, we'll be talking about some of those today, but that's the potential. The other reason to engage on this now is it's becoming more expensive. This tracks two lines, uh, or two, two different trends here, and it looks at what the GDP per capita needs to be of a country is that achieves what the, uh, what the mortality rate for child mortality, the blue line, was in 1950 in the average high income country. And the good news is it's getting cheaper. So poorer and poorer countries can achieve the same level of health performance on child mortality that we had 60 years ago, which is great news. But you see the opposite is the case for adult mortality, uh, both true for, uh, for women and men, although particularly true for men, that you need to be wealthier and wealthier as a country just to get where we were 60 years ago in high income countries. The longer we wait, the bigger the challenge. Any, any questions for clarification? That's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Thomas Boyke. Um, may I now um, invite uh, Adnan Haider, who is a professor and associate chair, international health director, health systems program, and Director of Johns Hopkins International Injury Research Unit, uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health, and an Associate Director of uh, Bioethics to give his Thank you very much.
First, uh, I'm so glad to see a few people here on the last day of the, of the conference, so thank you very much for coming to our session. Um, I want to acknowledge and thank the organizers because very often when you talk about non-communicable diseases, you forget about injury and violence. So the fact that I'm here is a testament to the openness of the organizers. And particularly Professor Nelson Soencambo, he not only approached me to deliver the talk, but gave me my title also. So I have to talk about um, uh, beyond epidemiology of injuries, and that's what I'm going to do today. And I think it might actually be a nice follow-on to your talk, Thomas, because what I want to do is quickly acknowledge the success and the burden data, the epidemiology, but really spend most of my time today in talking about some of the challenges in confronting the burden of injuries and violence. So in some ways, it goes beyond the analytic work that Thomas has indicated that it is time for us to do something. The question is how, where, and when. And that's some of the challenges I'd like to share with you today. Before I begin, a few of my assumptions or perceptions. Let's make sure that when I use the word injury, I'm talking about all injuries and violence. And I'm doing that because we are the only representation here today. I am indeed using a global perspective, but I am very, very biased towards low and middle income countries. Please don't hold that against me, but happy to debate with you uh, from a high income country perspective as well. And indeed, for every challenge and every generalization I make, of course, there's an exception, and that's part of the debate that we can have. Um, but to always remember that we are here together because we want to move forward. So the idea for me to raise these challenges is to stimulate our thinking about how to move ahead. So first, of course, we've had considerable success over the past 10 to 20 years. I've been in the field for injury prevention for nearly 20 plus years now. We have more recognition around the world of injury and violence. We've actually had increase in investments, particularly in fields such as road safety. We've had wider engagement. We've had global reports being published on issues like drowning and child injuries and road safety. And indeed, we have better information, both from uh, global data sources like the GBD, but also national specific surveys and data sources. And to some extent, the, the political global community at the UN, at WHO, and so on, are beginning to acknowledge that there is a third burden of injury and violence that actually impacts uh, particularly low and middle income countries. So I celebrate the success, and I want to acknowledge it, but I'm not going to dwell my time on repeating this. Let's fundamentally talk a little bit about where we are right now and where we want to go. So I want to share with you some of the thinking that I've been doing for the past few years and present to you a series of seven challenges, and I hope that some of my colleagues on the panel will reflect whether there is commonality in these challenges, not just from an injury and violence perspective, but from an NCD perspective as well. And some of you might find that these are generalizable. So the first challenge is the fact that there is continuing death and disability without action. And certainly as a public health professional, I find this quite unacceptable. We have more than 5 million deaths from injuries and violence around the world, which really means there are nearly 14,000 deaths that are going to happen today around the world from all of injury and violence put together. And yet, we continue to accept this. And we accept this for different reasons. We accept this for uh, both political reasons, for lack of uh, effort. We also sometimes are competing with each other. Thomas indicated uh, about the reducing burden of disease. We have a competition between how many diseases can cause one million deaths. This is called the millionaire's game, right? My disease causes one million and yours causes 1.2, so maybe yours is more important than mine. We have to get away from the zero-sum game mentality. We have to go to a, a perspective where all of them become important for our actions. So that's the first challenge that I'm confronting in my field. A second challenge that I confront in the field of injury and violence is that this notion that prevention is cheap, cost-effective, easy, and quick to do. I think as public health professionals, we must begin to understand that it may not be the cheapest strategy, it may not be the quickest strategy, but it is the right thing to do. And how do you define the right thing to do? How do you assess the metrics around this is really, really important. You hear things like, oh, that's too expensive to do, road safety prevention, or homicide prevention will take decades because of cultural change. 
And that's not true. That's not borne by the evidence. And this morning, we heard in the plenary about violence prevention strategies as well. Frankly, our evidence is quite weak. And a lot of rich research agenda is needed to test interventions in low and middle income countries in particular and see what their effectiveness and cost efficiency is. I think that represents a very important challenge for our community. I think a third challenge, which is really interesting, I call it the acknowledgement problem. The acknowledgement problem is that we are so happy when a minister says, yeah, that's a really important condition, I agree with you, professor, and then walks away and doesn't do anything about it. We write in our papers that this was part of the fifth paragraph of the national health policy, but we don't ask what happened after writing that fifth paragraph. Is there a program? Is there any investment to follow? So, Recognizing is indeed important, and I'm not decreasing the importance of that recognition, but we can't be happy with acknowledgement alone. We have to go beyond that. We have to go beyond the public acknowledgement phase into true investment, true, dedica true dedication, and programmatic follow-up. So that's the third challenge for our field. A fourth challenge, which I think might be common to some of my uh, NCD colleagues' work as well, is the problem of going to scale. And here this is really interesting because we, all of us, and including myself, do pilot programs. And now we are suffering from what has been termed pilotitis. We do pilot programs, they never go to scale. We are so happy it works in one district, doesn't go to the 70 districts. We are so excited that one of our provinces has achieved, but it doesn't go to the other 13 provinces. So we are having this major issue of taking programs from pilot to scale. And of course, as you know, there are challenges to that framework as well. Because in many instances, people want to move at scale from the beginning and learn as you go. And that's where many of my colleagues doing implementation science and implementation research, of course, have acknowledged that that's another pathway for testing interventions and programs as well. We have to solve the problem of going to scale. We cannot address injury and violence unless we do that at scale. And this is critically important for our field. A fifth challenge, which I think is embarrassing. Do you know what is embarrassing? Car seats were developed 55 years ago. How many people are using car seats in low and middle income countries? Smoke alarms, 52 years ago they were developed. Have you seen smoke alarms? Child-resistant containers, 50 years ago. Child bicycle helmets, 40 years ago. These interventions are available. Their scientific effectiveness has been demonstrated. The question is, we fail to implement them. The people who need them the most actually don't have them. And by the way, this distributional effect is not only in low and middle income countries, but right here. I come from the city of Baltimore, and Baltimore is missing smoke alarms. Children in Baltimore are not wearing helmets as well. So this is an issue that indeed is truly global and represents a challenge for all of us. The sixth challenge is what I call the guidance challenge, which is that just demonstrating that something works is not enough. But you need to take people through the process of how to develop that into a program, how to implement that program and make it successful. And so guidelines are needed. WHO has been very good at the normative level of producing lots of these guidelines, but in fact, as recent studies have demonstrated, and I've put one up on the slide for you, many of these guidelines are not actually implemented or used. And so it becomes actually very difficult then to develop programs and have the effect that they were intended to have without appropriate implementation. And many of you, of course, work in fields such as looking at the fidelity of interventions and how they're implemented at ground level. So this is critically important for us even when we think about program implementation. And then finally, I think the seventh challenge is something that I hope many of you will begin to recognize. It is our concepts of utilization and coverage. Distributing interventions to the general population is not what we are about. We should be about distributing and ensuring that people who need those interventions actually receive the intervention. So the definition of coverage has to have those people who need those interventions in the denominator. 
Because it is only when every child or every adult who needs to be safe achieves safety that we will live in an injury-free world. And so our metrics and our capacity to monitor and evaluate those programs have to improve. And I think that indeed is a challenge for us as well. So ladies and gentlemen, I've shared with you seven challenges. And the fact is that some of these challenges are not specific to injury and violence. As this paper demonstrated a couple of years ago very nicely, you've had other chemical and vaccine-related products that have been out there for years, and yet the children and adults and women who need to receive them have not received them for a long time. This implementation failure is indeed common to other areas of public health as well. So maybe it's time that we begin to learn from each other. In fact, there's this huge push for evidence-based policy making because people say if you have evidence-based policy making, you will solve your problems. The question then is, why isn't our policy evidence-based? There are genuine scientific disagreements sometimes. There are political disagreements at other times. And of course, as this our own country represents, there are lots of other things that can happen to derail evidence-based policy. But a recent book by Kate Smith demonstrates that maybe our framework in thinking about evidence-based policy is not about either or. It's not about one pathway to evidence-based policy making, but rather an interplay of different ideas, of different types of evidence that we need that come together to force a solution that is good for the people, good for the policymaker, and makes useful sense from a scientific and an economic perspective. So it's not about one piece of evidence or one clinical trial or one cost-effectiveness study, but rather about an interplay of ideas. And I think it is time for us to think in those complex terms, which means that we have to think about the research to policy interface, not in simple terms, but in terms that demonstrates that we recognize its complexity, that we recognize that there are multiple institutions and multiple powers at play in creating these policies that will help reduce the burden, in my case, of injury and violence. And very importantly, that there are multiple stakeholders in this process, not just those of us who are on the evidence generation or evidence receipt side, but lots of others as well. And indeed, very importantly, is this notion that I'm presenting to you of accountability. At the end of the day, 50 years ago, we developed interventions that are still not reaching the populations that indeed we care about. This will require not only explicit attention, but what I'm trying to propose to you may be a different skill set. And it's time for some of us to actually learn new skill sets, learn new competencies, so that we can engage effectively. I want to end by recognizing that while I am presenting to you some challenges, I hope the idea is to begin to explore solutions, to think how we can come up with concrete ways in moving ahead as part of this NCD burden. And very importantly, I'm also asking you to be part of the solution. I'm hoping that by sharing these challenges with you, I hope that 16, 1,700 of us, whoever have attended this conference, can come together next year in New York and actually crack at least one of these complex challenges. Thank you very much. Any burning questions, clarifications? All right, Let, let's proceed to the third speaker, um, Mofat Nirenda. He is a diabetologist and a chronologist and professor of global NCD, London School of uh, Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, he is also a lead NCD researcher at the MRC UVRI uh, unit in Uganda. Well, thanks very much. Uh, James, and uh, I also want to thank the uh, organizers for uh, inviting me to this meeting. Uh, I've had a fantastic time, really enjoyed it. And I also thank Nelson for um, prescribing the topic that I'm going to uh, uh, talk about today. So essentially to try and advocate that the origins and perhaps solutions to tackling NCDs actually lie in childhood. 
So Tom has um, a nicely articulated the epidemic, that uh, we have an epidemic, particularly in, in, in um, Africa, and, and uh, we have uh, seen infectious diseases getting, to some extent, under control, but at the same time, there is a huge rise in the prevalence of uh, non-communicable disease. So we have uh, what uh, is called the double burden of disease. But, but uh, fortunately, others have been through this. So if you look at high-income countries like the States, the United Kingdom, they are at the other end of the spectrum, where NCDs are much more um, a, 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 a prevalent and infectious diseases are more or less a, a dealt with. And, and, and therefore, we should be able to learn from what others have been through. But the, the difficulty that we have, or at least the lessons that we get, as um, uh, Tom has clearly alluded to, is that the epidemic in Africa seems to be a little different. So clearly, we're at the early spectrum of this epidemic, but it looks like the speed of this epidemic is much faster. So if you know, a, the states was going, was going down with infection like this, or going up with NCDs in a, a, a gentle fashion, at the moment in Africa, the steep of that slope is very uh, uh, steep. And, and, and the other thing is that when you see individuals with diabetes or hypertension or heart disease in the States or in Europe, it tends to be people who are relatively old, whereas um, if you go to a diabetic clinic, a hypertensive clinic in Nairobi or in uh, a, a Kampala, you actually meet a relatively young group of individuals. And, and um, although these conditions were previously uh, traditionally known to be disease of, diseases of affluence, in actual sense, if you go to the rural areas in these relatively poor communities, the burden is just as high. So that's a, a misconception that there are a, a diseases of affluence is no longer a, a, the case. And, and, and so this is just a, an example of where some of the work that was done in Malawi, we've gone to the communities at um, a population level and screened individuals for hypertension, diabetes, and lipid abnormalities in a very robust fashion. And what we see is that yes, a hypertension or diabetes goes up with them. So, so the older you are, the higher the risk that you have hypertension or diabetes is going to be. So that's not strange. That has been known for a, a number of years. But what is different is that, uh, as I said earlier on, when you look at the individuals who are affected, a huge proportion of these guys will be under the age of 50, so, so up to 50%. Whereas if you did the same here, it might be about 15 to 20% of individuals with these conditions may be under the age of 50. And, and uh, this is not just because of the differences in the population structure, that you know, we are a much younger population. Even if you adjust for that, the burden is much higher in individuals who are relatively young. And, and also in individuals who are not necessarily overweight or obese. Whereas um, if you encounter a, a population, a diabetic or a hypertensive population here, a good proportion of them will be a overweight or, or indeed obese. So the question is, what is making these individuals out there in Africa so particularly susceptible to non-communicable diseases? We don't know the answers yet, but that's where we think that at least some of the a, a, a origins will be in their early lives. So it may be genetics, but we don't think that it's necessarily genetics. It might be the environment in which these individuals lived earlier on in life. And there is evidence that supports that. that that's what I want to just touch on a little bit. So, so this graph essentially uh, describes work that was um, undertaken by a very eminent professor who was supported by the MRG, uh, David Berker, who looked at a population in the UK uh, uh, in a county where they were particularly good at keeping records. So he went back to look at records of individuals who were at this time in their middle ages, 50, 60 years old, and traced their birth records and observed that if you are 
a, a, of low birth weight, you have a much higher risk of hypertension, you have a much higher risk of being diabetic than if you are born of normal birth weight. So, so clearly, it, it suggests that you know, these uh, a, a, a conditions can have their origins quite early in life, in actual sense, well before you are born. And, and birth weight is obviously a surrogate marker. We think that it might reflect some insults in, in utero, and, and most notably, perhaps, to do with malnutrition, maternal, uh, maternal undernutrition, and, and experimental uh, uh, studies, including those that uh, have been done in animals, have supported this. So it looks like maternal malnutrition during pregnancy may well a uh, program, as we call it, individuals to have a much higher risk of diabetes, hypertension, and other non-communicable non diseases later on in life. It may not just be malnutrition, it may be other stresses like infection, for, ex for example, uh, and there is a, a theory that you know, the a mediator for all this may well be stress hormones, which will be a, 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 you know, a, a high when you are uh, when, when you are malnourished, or in, or indeed when you have got an infection, so so this has developed into a very huge body of work, and and the a concept is now called the developmental origins of health and disease, and recognizing that if there is a place where this is going to be at a greatest in terms of play, then Africa will be one of those. A, 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 places, low-income low countries where you still are suffering from a nutritional insults uh, as well as um, other insults like, like infection will be a fertile ground for this sort of a, a, a programming to take place. And, and what we've shown recently is that the window for this um, a programming of NCDs is not necessarily just before you are born. So, so we've uh, looked at a kiddies that were acutely undernourished, acute malnutrition, and, and followed them up and looked at markers of um, non-communicable diseases, and we see that, yes, indeed, if you have a, a malnutrition in early childhood, you have a much higher risk of having your blood pressure higher, having your blood glucose levels uh, deranged compared to your sibling, or indeed a co a community a, a, a controls. And, and so, so we have uh, a papers in the global, uh, Lancet Global Health last year, end of last year, and this paper just came out um, uh, this week in the European uh, Respiratory Journal, suggesting that early life events, particularly insults, including uh, uh, undernutrition, can program later risk of NCDs, uh, uh, like diabetes and hypertension. And, and I don't want you to go away with the a, a, a feeling that it's all about undernutrition. Africa or you know, low-income countries a, exist within the global burden of uh, a obesity. And, 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 and um, this is a report a commissioned by the a WHO which looked at uh, how fat kiddies are getting around the world. And over the last few years, it's Africa where the uh, uh, rise in obesity is higher. So between 2019 and a few years, a couple of years ago, the, the number of individuals, children who were overweight or obese in Africa had actually a, a doubled. And, and as a continent, we have a quarter of you know, a, a kids that have of, a, a, a suffer from overweight or, or obesity in the preschool age. So, so we have this unique combination of a and the nutrition sitting side by side with the relative of a nutrition. And, and, and this is a huge challenge, considering that these will potentially have additive effects. So if you have someone who is primed to having diabetes because they were of low birth weight, and then you add on to that excessive weight gain, and, and, and in itself a huge risk factor for um, non-communicable diseases, you will have acceleration of, of these um, a, a conditions. So, so what we want to propose is that, in as far as NCDs are concerned, we have to look at it in a much more life course fashion. 
So we have to look at factors that operate quite earlier on in life, which will be important. Unfortunately, we can't put a figure at the moment in terms of the magnitude of the effect. So this a, a cartoon here is leading because it may well be that the a, impact of an uh, early life event is going to be much higher than what you get when you smoke or when you have a, a sedentary lifestyle. But it, it just illustrates the case that uh, you know, these uh, uh, risks are cumulative and they start quite earlier on in life. And when we approach NCDs in terms of strategies to uh, prevent or indeed control, we need to look at these very much uh, proximal uh, factors. And, and that's exactly what we're trying to do at the moment. So we have um, a, a interventional studies that are looking at reducing the rates of obesity in, in school children, uh, reducing the amount of salt intake in, in school children, and hopefully that will uh, uh, feed onto their families. But at the same time, to try and explore whether there is a window of opportunity to reverse some of the adverse effects that and the nutrition, particularly acute malnutrition and stunting, has a, a, a on um, a, the risk of NCDs. So, so we are targeting a girls and boys around the time of adolescence. We think that that might potentially provide a window for intervention and, and, and hopefully a, a ameliorate, ameliorate some of the a, effects that uh, we've observed. So, so I'm not going to talk about that today. Today was just to the case forward for the fact that uh, the origins of NCDs may at least in part have uh, their basis in childhood. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Moffat. Any questions? Or we'll uh, go to our last speaker, uh, Kaushik Ramaya who is the CEO and consultant physician at um, Sri Hindu Mandal Hospital, an honorary lecturer at Muhimbili University of Health and Allied Sciences in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and is a board member of the World Diabetes Foundation. Uh, good afternoon, and I uh, would like to thank the organizers for inviting us for this important meeting. Uh, you, have, you have seen the policy challenges, you have seen the challenges faced in uh, implementing NCD programs. What I'm going to show you here in Tanzania, what we have been able to do on the ground and try to implement a program which probably would sort of, for, sort of a, for, form a framework for integration of NCDs together with the infectious diseases and trying to see how we can actually utilize the limited resources and implement a program which is affecting nationwide. So when we look at the national program, we started with a small clinic trying to see with an increasing burden of non-communicable disease, trying to pilot a program with the Ministry of Health and seeing what can be done to implement a program which could work in the public sector, which would be regional and the district hospital. So we devised a national diabetes NCD program which was implemented under the National NCD Strategy and coordinated by the Ministry of Health and implemented by the Tanzania Diabetes Association. And this was supported partly by the World Diabetes Foundation. If you look at the specific objectives of this program, basically we had to strengthen the capacity of NCD and diabetes at all the district regional and referral hospitals. And these were about 30 regional hospitals and 187 district hospitals with four major referral hospitals. Second objective was to establish an effective referral system from lower levels of care to higher levels of care, depending on the conditions which are there. Include, improve the community awareness of the NCDs in the target areas. Strengthen the surveillance and monitoring system with the data recording systems. Strengthen the NCD corruption within the different services at the zonal and regional level and have an integrated approach with infectious disease clinics. And finally, establish cooperation with other stakeholders, including the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Education to in implement the school health program. Now, if you look at the burden, a snapshot of a burden, 
If you see diabetes, rural population in 1990s, in rural population from the population-based studies, it was less than 1%. Hypertension was less than 7%. In urban population, it was less than 2%, while hypertension was less than 15%. A recent step survey which we did showed a diabetes rate of 9% and a hypertension rate of 27%. And if you see within this subset, Previously diagnosed was only 2% with diabetes and 2% with hypertension. So you find that over the last 20 to 25 years, the burden of non-communicable disease has increased tremendously in the country. Other risk factors, dyslipidemia increased from 15 to 32%, obesity 12 to 36% in urban areas, and in rural areas, the obesity has increased from 5% to 25%. Ischemic heart disease, we do not have much data, but the clinical evidence currently shows, clinic evidence shows that there's increasing trend of ischemic heart disease and stroke, again, based on the previous data, we have the incidence of stroke and the presence of stroke is extremely high. Gestational diabetes, a study which we did recently, again, in rural population, it was less than 1%, in urban population, it was 8.4%, and this was very closely linked with hypertension in pregnancy, which was around 20 to 25%. So within the national program, we planned out to do the training of the healthcare providers, which included two doctors and two nurses from each of the district and the regional hospitals. And we also did the cross-training of healthcare providers from the HIV clinics, from the TB clinics, from the eye clinics, and from the dental clinics. And overall, the program was based on the fact that we would like to integrate the services so that even in an HIV clinic or in a TB clinic, if a person with diabetes or hypertension goes there, is able to get an appropriate treatment, they get able to get an appropriate diagnosis and a cross-reference. So overall, the condition, the, 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 the program was to train each and every healthcare provider in different services at each level. In addition to that, we also developed nutritional guidelines for the non-communicable disease, and we ensured that we have a nutritional social train at the regional and the district level for providing the preventive care and the education safe. So over the last three years, we have trained more than 2,900 healthcare providers in 187 districts, and 30 regional hospitals, and four regional, four major referral hospitals. And this has been, again, training and retraining, continuing within the same centers and the same regions and the zones. Then we started looking at, once we have established the NCD clinics, we started looking at what are the areas where we can do the integration of the clinics, where we can look at the infectious disease and the non-infectious disease, and what are the commonalities. The commonalities would be one with the diagnosis, whether the diagnosis we can done at the different clinics, education sessions can be done, whether the laboratory services could be harmonized, whether we have one laboratory which is doing all the different components because otherwise you have parallel labs and which requires additional resources and that results into a lot of limitations of care. And together with that, managing the complications. So we st started charting out what are the commonalities we could do and a part of the training, we started looking at these commonalities in different components of diagnosis, laboratory, laboratory work, and then post care and the post diagnosis. We also looked at the different components of the laboratory services because under the HIV program, most of the laboratories in the regional and the district hospitals were very well equipped with the hematology analyzer, the biochemistry analyzer, and this could be very well used, utilized also for making a diagnosis in patients who have got non-communicable diseases. Initially, being the vertical programs, it was very difficult to integrate the care at that level. So we also started looking at the infrastructure, whether we could have a chronic disease clinic approach. And within the chronic disease care chronic approach, what would be the facilities and the infrastructure required? We would require infrastructure for the clinics, for the pre and the post diagnosis counseling, for the education, and all these components. So all these were charted out at different levels, trying to see how we can integrate the services. We also looked out at the chart of how do we basically amalgamate the two programs, because these are two different programs at the non-communicable disease unit within the Ministry of Health, and then we have a national AIDS control program. And at what level could we have an integration? Of course, we had a lot of challenges. One was the power imbalance, the financial disparity, because the HIV program and the PEPFA program, the USAID program, had huge amount of resources available, 
So they were not ready to share those resources. Then there was a historical difference between infectious and non-infectious disease. And then you have the centralized HIV program with the localized and regionalized NCD programs. And then we had a separate monitoring and evaluation system. So these challenges still persist, but we are trying to overcome them by showing them different ways in which we can actually work together. We also started looking at proof of concept theory and trying to go into separate clinics and trying to see how we can show to the policymakers and different programs that how can this integration be very effectively done. As a part of the assessment, we looked at different clinics at the regional level, dispensaries, health centers, at the regional hospitals and the referral hospitals, and try to look at what are the services available at these levels and where are the gaps. And if you see here in the gaps here, if you see the antenatal services within the hospital, within the delivery immunization, the family planning, HIV and TB, you see these services have almost around 90 to 95 percent coverage. But when you look at NCDs and other, other, other hypertension, diabetes, and other NCDs, the coverage was less than 20% in most of these facilities at different levels of care. Again, if you look at health and education counseling services being offered at all these clinics, again, you find nutritional component, the HIV AIDS, the breastfeeding, and the TB leprosy program had more than 70 to 80% of the coverage at all the levels of care. But if you look at diabetes, hypertension, cancer, asthma, and physical activity. It was less than 20% of the coverage at these levels of care. So we had to start working at, at dispensary level, at the health center level, at the district levels, at the regional hospital levels, trying to see that already there's an existing programs which are very effectively done. And what you needed was just an additional resources to bring them to, to a level whereby both the communicable and the non-communicable disease could be captured at the primary and the secondary level. So we have started in one of the regions trying to see the integration of the care. And what we're trying to do, because currently we have a triaging at the HIV clinic, we have got a triaging at the TB clinic, we have got a triaging at the antenatal care clinic, and you've got a triaging at the general clinic. And you have this huge amount of resources being used at the different triaging. So we have started with a concept whereby we feel that the dispensary or health center level, you could have a standardized triaging being done at a standard level. You have one triaging center which actually does the blood pressure, the body mass index, the blood glucose. We do the provider, provider initiated HIV counseling testing in the TB screening. And based on this diagnosis being done, then they can be directed to the different clinics and you could have basically a centralized program which works effectively at the primary level, at the dispensary level, and at the health center level. In addition to that, you use the community health workers trying to do the screening program, the mass media, the school health programs, and the workplace programs. We have started that in one of the programs in the, one of the regions with 35 clinics which are there, and we have started training this in January, and hopefully by December we'll come to know what is happening, and after the evaluation, probably we'll go to the ministry and try to see if we can implement this program all over the country. The benefits of this approach, of an integrative approach, is that you've got sharing of the human resources because of the limited human resources. You are able to actually affect all the non-communicable disease. We are able to share the physical space because there's a limitation of physical space available. Again, the laboratory personnel and the laboratory equipment can be shared very well. Again, with TB, HIV, and diabetes, comorbidities together with hypertension, Again, you can have the shared resources there. Community health workers can be very effectively used, and you have one center stop at the primary health care level. The way forward, what we are thinking about is that the at the secondary and tertiary care health facilities, we're going to put the protocols in place for the appropriate referral systems to be in place. The primary care is to be piloted, as we have said, in one of the regions we already started, and community health workers will be the key in driving the prevention agenda. And fortunately, the Ministry of Health has already formalized the community health worker schedule, and now they are basically being integrated into the Ministry of Health, and they would be like an outreach programs. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you very much. We've had uh, our four presentations. We will now enter into uh, a period of Q&As and some discussion. If, if I can start off by asking each one of you some general questions just to uh, get things uh, started off. Um, Thomas Boy Boyke, your, your, your presentation was excellent. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, one thing that we often uh, worry about from LMIC is really the availability of uh, data and the robustness of data um, in all health fields, but more so in NCD. Um, we have data collected during um, the general uh, delivery of care, but often it's not robust enough for you to be able to make um, very strong um, uh, analysis, conclusions, and recommendations. Um, I'd like you to comment just on um, uh, your data sources and uh, the robustness of, of, of data. While you're thinking about that, let me move on to uh, Adnan Haider. Um, injuries and, and violence. That's um, obviously a very broad area, and some uh, much more severe than others. And for, for those of us who are not, um, who do not focus on that area, uh, it, it is fairly diffuse. So you may want to sort of give us a sense of classification, type of injuries, and um, uh, how data is collected, especially in the um, you know, resource-limited uh, setting. And um, Mofat Nirenda, you, you, you've made an excellent presentation and, and uh, you have a very academic uh, approach to uh, looking at um, uh, NCDs and, and really trying to get down to uh, etiologies there. Um, I'm sure you've um, uh, spent time and effort to try and see uh, the kind of research data that's available on NCDs in, let's focus just on Sub-Saharan Africa. I would, I would really want you to comment on um, what sort of uh, data is available and uh, what do you see as the immediate needs and how should we approach it. Um, I'm saying this because um, uh, th there are a lot of vertical programs, especially uh, in infectious diseases, plus maternal and ch child health, which are well supported, and data collection seems uh, a lot more robust. So I would like you to, to make that comment. And um, Kaushik, that was um, an excellent presentation, and I've sort of listened to you uh, a number of times before, and, and you obviously have um, uh, some um, excellent um, way of um, ensuring that you leverage the resources that are available within the country itself to um, ensure that you scale up some of these programs. Just give us a sense of uh, the support you have from the government of Tanzania, and are there any, anything you, is there anything unique that uh, other African countries could, could, could copy? I mean, I know countries that um, have uh, tried over decades to put together a strategic plan for NCDs. And it's often, you know, a 10-page, 12-page document that is never really um, uh, taken up to scale. So if you could just briefly comment on those. I'm sorry, um, we have a few people uh, standing, but you've been sitting for too long. <laughs> Think of it as NCD prevention. Um, but I will, uh, I will thank you so much for the kind comments about the presentation and uh, for, your, for your good leadership in organizing this uh, panel today. Uh, it's true, on the data front, uh, we've been very fortunate to have uh, the development of the Global Burden of Disease Project with the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, and that has greatly improved our, having those estimates has greatly improved our understanding of what the burden is and uh, directionally where it's, where it's going. 
but obviously in the poorest countries that have the, the least amount of infrastructure around vital registration, and particularly around conditions that aren't being currently uh, prioritized by the health systems in those countries, you know, one, one would certainly like to see uh, better data evolve uh, in that area, and that's something we should be investing in. And there's projects to, to invest more in uh, vital registration um, uh, information in those settings. The two things I want to, I want to give one word of caution, though, on the data front, and then talk about a specific area where I think we should, we should see more investment, even beyond the vital registration point. The one bit of caution on the data is we, we of course, didn't wait for perfect data on other global health issues. Uh, we, we, we didn't wait for perfect information as to what the, what the burden of HIV was in countries and uh, neglected tropical diseases. We recognize that it's certainly directionally a, a problem and it's something we should care about because it's affecting young people at an increasing rate. And I, and I think the, the same dynamics exist on, on non-communicable diseases. And obviously with better data, we can uh, implement uh, uh, better interventions or more targeted interventions, but I would hate to wait for the advent of perfect data before we, before we respond. The one area where I do think we could uh, relatively soon uh, have better data is uh, through our global health, current global health platforms. We don't actually, when we, we, we've invested a lot in uh, the last eight years in monitoring evaluation, but they of course focus on the particular diseases uh, targeted by those interventions, and we don't actually assess the health of the populations generally that go through uh, those programs, PEPAR funded clinics. Uh, it would be really useful, I mean, as I mentioned, uh, Ambassador Goosby spoke very powerfully uh, in the context of our report about what his experiences are, but they're, they're largely anecdotal. It would be good to have evidence as to, to the extent that we are, we are spending on global health, uh, are we reducing diseases or are we increasing the health of people? Yeah. And at the end of the day, I, we would, it would be good to have better insights into what's actually happening with the populations addressed through those programs, not just their HIV burden or the other diseases targeted. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna try and be brief because I'd love to hear what comments and questions are from the floor. First, uh, in terms of the stance of the definition of injuries and violence, it's probably narrower than non-communicable diseases, which includes cancer, mental health, cerebrovascular, cardiovascular disease. There are two large families, one called the unintentional injuries, which includes things like road traffic injuries, poisoning, falls, burns. Um, and then there are the intentional injuries of violence, which includes things like sexual violence, intimate partner violence, homicides, assaults, and so on. Those are the two large families. Um, and these cover one chapter of the International Classification of Diseases for those of you who are ICD-based. In terms of data, uh, just like NCDs, a generalizable statement is that we have a dearth of data. However, in the 20 years that I've spent in the field, we have a lot more data today than we ever did. Um, and to slightly challenge Tom, although I know you weren't saying this, um, the Global Burden of Disease Study can only be as good as the data that goes into the production of DALIs. And many of us have very appropriate and genuine concerns about the quantum of data and the quality of the data that goes, particularly towards 70% uh, of Sub-Saharan Africa where registration of births and deaths fundamentally doesn't occur, particularly cause of death estimation. And that causes uh, magnificent modeling exercises to be conducted, which of course we eventually believe at the global level, but at regional and national level you have to be really, really careful because those models are appropriate at macro level, but not necessarily at micro level. So I think that's really important. I think in the field of injury and violence, thanks to modules being added to demographic and health surveys um, and other types of national health surveys, but also um, surveillance strategies. And these are things like trauma registries and hospitals, as well as the in-depth demographic and surveillance sites where specific information has been collected on injury and trauma that we've been able to build some of this um, uh, resources on. So I think that things are evolving, but I very much want to support this notion that we cannot wait for action for the perfect data. I think we know enough, particularly in terms of interventions, and that's part of the challenge that I raised. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks very much. So I mean, I, I totally agree. I mean, we are seeing increasing data, 
uh, even in uh, uh, Africa. But the a challenge that we still have, I think, is the quality of that data. So even the surveys that have been done by WHO, you know, they bring up conflicting uh, 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 findings, mostly because the robustness, robustness of the data collection is, is not there. So, you know, uh, how do you measure a, a blood glucose? What do you use? Are people fasted? So, so like, like you said earlier on, garbage in, garbage out. So we may have a huge amount of data, but if they are not of good quality, we will have those um, uh, challenges. You know, it's not just about the burden. I think it's also about defining the disease phenotypes. If you know, in Asia, for example, we now uh, are told that you can't use the same scales for um, a BMI a risk stratification, for example, because they've done good studies with good data, and which have shown that you, know, you will be at a much higher risk of diabetes, hypertension, even when your BMI is within the conventional normal range. So we need to do the same for, um, for Africa. I, I was talking about the a phenotype of diabetes, that it's occurring in people who are relatively young, who are not necessarily obese, and yet the guidelines in terms of treatment for diabetes is such that um, metformin is first line treatment. That's because in most cases, you know, from people who suffer from diabetes here, the diabetes will be mostly driven by overweight and obesity. But if it's not driven by overweight and obesity, in, in Africa it may be some extent driven because uh, by, by the fact that the organs are smaller because they have suffered you know, malnutrition earlier on in life and therefore you have um, what is sometimes called organ sparing. You, so you spare your brain, but you eat up your pancreas or your kidneys, you are more likely to have hypertension and diabetes. And your first line treatment, therefore, will not be metformin because uh, you are not dealing with insulin resistance. So these good observations or, or thorough observations will end up making a huge impact in terms of uh, practice. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think uh, the success of the program in Tanzania has been involving the Ministry of Health right from the day you conceptualize the program. I think the bigger mis mistakes we do is that sometimes <coughs> you start a proof of concept program where you're not involved the ministry. And I think once you start involving them right from day one, being part of your program from day one, I think it works very well. Of course, there are a lot of challenges. There is a lot of politics to it. There is a lot of, uh, uh, I think, convincing to be done. But things can move if you involve them right from day one. The NCD strategy or the diabetes strategy, uh, it was basically the organizations with the people like NCD Alliance, the Diabetes Association, the Cardiovascular, the Heart Association are the ones who drafted out the original concept of the strategy and then went to the ministry, involving the ministry, and then coming out with a document. So basically, we are on the second NCD strategy after the first five years. And based on what successes and the failures we had at the end of first five years, we have developed the second one, which has started implementing from last year. And it is mainly to do with the implementation of actually scaling up all over. So I think participatory approach has been the key to the success there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, We'll, we'll try and take uh, four or five questions. If we can start from there. Okay. Tell us who you, are, who you are, where you're from, and who you're directing your question to. OK. Um, Jim Shelton. I'm a journal editor at Global Health Science and Practice, uh, Johns Hopkins University. We're very interested in scalable interventions in this area. Uh, I guess you'll hear who my, uh, projecting my question to. Um, I, um, uh, Richard Horton has set a, a nice standard for provocative questions and statements, so I'm going to try to live up to that. Um, I, uh, I feel like I have heard a lot about problems here, but really, I've got to say, still pretty thin on the solutions. And the main solution I kind of heard put forward is the clinical solution. You know, as doctors, we ha we get, we're like the carpenter with a hammer. We go around and we try to treat people for stuff, and I'm for that. And I think it's, it's, it's a useful thing, and I do a little bit of it myself, 
but I think it's a long way to, to, to go for that. Half the people with hypertension in the United States are not under treatment, just as one factoid to put on the table to try to, to make my case. So I'm hoping that um, the Council on Foreign Relations has gone a bit beyond that paradigm because I do think it's not easy. If it weren't easy, we, if we were easy, we wouldn't be here. But I do think there are creative areas upstream beyond the clinical solution. For example, we heard yesterday, uh, same data, global burden of disease, that um, uh, you know, we think of tobacco as the big number one in terms of chronic disease, it, uh, in terms of mortality, seven million people. But guess what the number one actually is? It's pollution. And the largest driver of that is outdoor air pollution. And the largest driver of that is coal. And so now what is saving us from, this is gonna be provocative, uh, what is saving us from going back to, and most of that is coal and nuclear in power plants. What is saving us in the United States for not going back to coal. It is fracking, hydraulic fracking, which people, everybody in, the, in my liberal friends are all up in arms about. But actually, I mean, I do think that there are kinds of, you know, in, by the way, the geology of the US is not unique in terms of being able to do hydraulic fracking. It's something that can be done all over the world. So um, if we could eliminate coal as one thing, that would be a huge contribution to uh, global health, and by the way, it it uh, uh, synchronizes with the theme of this conference, which is planetary health. And you know, I, I actually, when I hear about discussions about climate change and plan, I don't hear about the health consequences of, of pollution. I would hope that the Council on Foreign Relations, which can extend well beyond this sort of clinical paradigm, I'm sorry for taking so much time, w does have in its report. You know, these kinds of things, supporting uh, 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 wind and solar, you know, getting us away from, and then of course there's tobacco and all these other things. I'm hoping you're thinking about these upstream kinds of things, and that's, I guess, my question. Thank you. Let's move to the middle here. Ijeoman Nadim, Wayne State University, Detroit, Michigan, um, Internal Medicine and Pediatrics. Uh, my question is for the gentleman from Kenya. Um, oh, am I wrong or right? I apologize. Dr. Mirena, is that right? Mirena. Mirena, yes, I'm, I apologize. Okay, um, just a quick clarification. Did you say a quarter of the world's obese and overweight children are now found in Africa? Is that correct? Oh, okay. Um, so I wonder if that would change the media's image of Africa as cachectic, naked kid, children to now a uh, cute chopster smiling and how that would impact funding. But um, a question, a follow-up question to that is, um, in your studies, did you look at the role of uh, the intervention for treating low birth weight as, a, as possibly playing into future risks for hypertension and diabetes? Um, so the epigenetics, I guess, uh, just in terms of the ag uh, aggressive approach to treating low birth weight, the types of foods given and how fast um, uh, the children gained weight, et cetera, and if that had any role ultimately as opposed to necessarily uh, in utero or prenatal factors. So I'm just curious to know about that. Um, and then also for everyone on the panel, uh, what lessons can be learned from your experiences and your work that are translatable here for those of us who work in the global north at um, treating obviously non-communicable diseases as our prevalent uh, conditions that we address? And what are, in the spirit of bi-directional learning, what are some lessons, lessons we can learn from your work that could help us here in our, in our provision of care? Yeah, thank you very much. L let's try and confine ourselves to one question per questioner. I, I have the privilege of asking as many questions as I want. <laughs> Let let's hear from you. Okay, Lucille Pilling, Thomas Jefferson University, Philadelphia, member of the uh, NCD committee since its uh, formation many years ago. I do have a simple question, but it's a tough one. Thank you for your excellent example of how tough it is uh, from Tanzania. My question is, how are we going to fund the NCDs? 
Thank you. Miru? Hi, Ken Brain from the University of Pennsylvania uh, in Philadelphia as well, and uh, work in Central America with NCDs. Uh, my question um, uh, is really uh, not directed to anyone in particular in the panel, which is really that Ama Atta and Leader Sterling, the first minister of health in Tanzania, taught us uh, something about primary care, and the late Barbara Starfield really defined primary care. I wonder if instead of shifting from infectious diseases in a disease-specific way to non-communicable diseases in a disease-specific way, we'll, we'll um, actually be looking at different proxies for not having access to comprehensive primary care, and if the, the potential solution, uh, to go back to um, the earlier question, is actually embracing uh, comprehensive primary care in under-resourced or low- and middle-income countries. Okay, let, let's, um, yeah, the one behind you, because she's been standing for some time, then uh, they will respond to those questions. Then we'll take another round. Thank you, Selena Gore with the Global Alliance for Chronic Diseases. We're in alliance with the world's largest funders of medical and health research, and we focus on NCDs in the LMIC um, parts of the world uh, with a particular emphasis on implementation research. So this session is, uh, is really important one for us. I have one question for the panel, which is, if our board came to you and said, how would you spend $100 million, which is a question we have to ask ourselves every year, what would your answer be? Thank you. Thank you. This panel can respond. Great. Uh, uh, fantastic set of questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you for them. Uh, so to answer the first question on uh, pollution or uh, uh, focus more on um, modifiable uh, behavioral risks also is, as part of that. Uh, so we looked in a separate paper in Health Affairs uh, last year, a similar group of collaborators looked at the countries that had achieved a, the level of performance that the WHO has asked for by 2025. So they've called for a 25% reduction in under 70 mortality for each of the four major diseases. And we looked at the countries that had achieved that level of performance in the same block of time. So from 2000 to 2012, are there any countries that had achieved a 25% reduction? And what we found there is that uh, there were, uh, which is the good news, uh, particularly for cardiovascular, chronic respiratory illnesses, to a lesser extent for diabetes, and unfortunately to a very limited extent for cancer. Uh, but the way that they achieved them may not be uh, the, the way people might assume, which is the big changes in those countries were threefold. Uh, they had an increase in wealth. They had significant reductions in tobacco use, and they had significant reductions in household air pollution, which is probably in connection related to the increase in wealth. And the way we interpreted that result is that the link to wealth is tied primarily, there's a strong uh, correlation to health spending and the wealth of the country, so we think it's probably related to that. And my point about this is that I, I think the long-term sustainability of any response to NCDs will involve population-based prevention of modifiable risks. It will involve more action on pollution. But we also need to be careful about prescribing a set of interventions for poor countries that wealthy countries themselves have never followed. And I think the risk I hear about NCDs all the time are people say, well, it doesn't matter if we have aid, because ultimately the solution to these are, are policies, population-based prevention policies. And the reality is, in terms of the countries that have achieved the gains that we've had, it's about finding ways to provide uh, clinical prevention, which is a lot of what we talked about in that report, uh, as well as uh, you know, affordable, scalable treatment. We should definitely pursue the issues on the long-term uh, uh, prevention and focus on modifiable risk, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't forget what has allowed us to achieve dramatic reductions in wealthy countries either and focus on ways of doing that more cheaply. Uh, I'll only respond to a couple of points on uh, some of the other questions uh, made, but on the learning, bi-directional learning, uh, I think that's critical, particularly on, these, uh, on this issue of population-based prevention and of modifiable behavioral risk. This is something we do very poorly in wealthy countries and 
there's no question we have as much to learn uh, from poor countries as they have to learn from us in many of these areas. The same is true on, on frugal innovations, and I think that's uh, particularly important. The individual who uh, argued for primary care, I think clearly the long-term solution to this can only be through uh, better, uh, better primary uh, care. Uh, at a, because so many of these patients are presenting late and having such bad outcomes, and it's hard to reverse unless you see more investment there. Thank, Thank you. you. What I'll do is I'll just make maybe three observations, and that'll be a, a response to some of the questions that have been raised first. I'm going to use the example of road safety. So the solution to road traffic injuries often comes from outside the health sector. It's about sustainable transport. It's about better urban living. It's about getting to people uh, safely walking and safely cycling. In other words, it is about planetary health. So it's about those strategies that medical doctors in particular, and certainly the health sector in general, are uncomfortable because they haven't done it before. So it's about that type of uh, engagement that I think you're calling for. And in fact, SDG 3.6, while it focuses on mortality, SDG 11 focuses on sustainability. And I think that's an opportunity for us to work together in those, in those perspectives. Second, I think in terms of the primary healthcare movement, I think what is being tested now is moving to a model where primary healthcare workers that traditionally are focused on maternal, neonatal, and child health into NCDs. And many countries are experimenting with that possibility. Some people call it task shifting of primary healthcare, others are calling it new tasks. Whatever the framework is, I think that's a very, very rich source of new real world research because we need to understand whether those supply strategies will actually work to achieve the outcomes that we want in terms of disease reduction, in particular of NCDs. But I think that's something that we really need to think about. And my gosh, with six states in this country having repealed motorcycle helmet laws, talk about the need for evidence-based policymaking. We are going backwards, and it's time that we begin to learn from low- and middle-income countries that are actually catching up in terms of implementation of these laws. So I think this notion of not only uh, what people have called reverse innovation, but also this transmigration of lessons is critically important because it's not about doing it the first time, but it's sustaining the momentum to actually keep those interventions in place. And I think that's going to be a, a very, very important strategy going forward. Thank you. Uh, specifically on the question of uh, huge numbers of uh, uh, kids in Africa with um, uh, overweight and obese uh, uh, characteristics, some of it is about the population structure. So we have a huge a, a proportion of individuals who are young, so, so, and hence the, the, the numbers will be high. A, a, in terms of the public health of the link between low birth weight or early life insults and later disease, I think that's an important one, uh, but it hasn't been advocated for as much as it should be, because it has so far been driven as an academic exercise. I think we need to learn to communicate better, particularly in uh, issues where you are dealing with something that happens now having a much longer term effect and you may not be in a way to track it immediately. We need better ways of, of, of uh, communicating in terms of uh, policy change. But, but clearly, it's, it's an important issue. I think the, the funding issue is, is a critical one in terms of where will the money for NCDs come from. A, you know, there has been a fair amount of money in HIV, and, and that's been donor-driven. We may not necessarily get that for NCDs, and if it's for NCDs, which NCDs? Is it injuries? Is it mental health? Is it cardiovascular disease? So I think it's going to be very difficult. Uh, and therefore, it will, to some, some extent, rely on local governments owning the, the uh, responsibility of, of tackling NCDs with the help of donors. But at the same time, it will require flexibility on part of the donors for an integrated approach because uh, there is no point in uh, getting all these gains in treating individuals with HIV just for them to die with cardiovascular disease because they are at a particular high risk of that. So I think it needs negotiation, collaboration between uh, donors and government, but with local governments actually owning a, a bigger share of the responsibility. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 
I'll start with primary care. I think that 70 to 80 percent of the population, for example, in Tanzania, their first contact is with the primary care. And, and that's the reason why we focusing at primary care and focusing that just like the home-based workers which we had, which was a very successful program during HIV AIDS, I think the community health workers who are very close to the communities would actually be the key people to put in prevention and at the same time make, make sure that we have an early diagnosis once the community is aware. Because the community awareness is extremely poor. And because there's a lot of fallacies about it, I think primary health is going to be the major source. And primary care, if you train people how to just do the appropriate diagnosis and then try it, depending on putting them into the different levels of the referral system, I think it would work quite well. And, and what we have started, we are also looking at the cost effectiveness of doing that within a year, then probably we would have very early answers to that one. The second question is funding NCDs. I think that has been the major challenge because NCD is always perceived as an expensive chronic disease and it is going to be lifelong. And the donors normally tend to keep arm's length, arm's length to these NCDs. And I think the governments have to come up with innovative financing, trying to see can, how can they, because at the end of the day, you can have the best program, but when a patient comes to the clinic and if he cannot get his antihypertensive medication because there's no drug available, you have done nothing. So I think that innovative financing will have to come from the governments themselves trying to see how can they fund the NCD. But the major component has to be putting funding into the preventive component. And the question which we had was, how would you expect 100 million USD to be spent? I think if you were to ask me, then I would say that about 40 to 50 percent of it needs to be spent in prevention, probably starting with the school health programs, starting with preventive programs in in probably sub-Saharan Africa, talking about sub-Saharan Africa from the experience, probably 20 to 30 percent in the health systems, trying to see, and then probably remaining 20 percent in doing operational research, trying to improve. How do you improve the effectiveness of care, what you are providing, and creating very simple protocols of care, which are cost-effective, but which have got a huge success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we'll not be able to take the uh, questions from the three people standing, I will invite you to come and ask the uh, presenters privately. Um, Thomas, Adnan, Moffat, and Kaushik, let me thank you for your excellent presentations. We have gone over our time, so thank you. Before you go, folks, just one message. Uh, to get the kind, to know how to communicate, we're having a communications workshop today uh, with the Pulitzer Center. It's not at 6.30, it's at 4.30, 4.30 at the Monroe Room. Please be there, we will have journalists, scientists who will tell you how to get your message out uh, very successfully. So if you can be there, please do. 4.30, Monroe, thank you. <laughs>